is The Authority, Authority. The David Webb Show. Eight six six nine five patriot nine five seven two eight seven four on Twitter at David Webb Show, the former governor of Puerto Rico and Democrat member of a bipartisan Puerto Rico statehood commission, Pedro Rosello Navarez, joins me to discuss the revived effort for statehood in Puerto Rico. Uh, there has been a significant debate that has been reinvigorated following the hurricane. Let's assess for a moment. Since 1898, where the original vote occurred, how we got to this point, including a vote on June 11th of 2017 on the question of statehood. The the economics of Puerto Rico plays heavily into this. The, the way that island has governed itself plays into this because the people pay the ultimate price, and that is just the obvious case, for the economics of any territory, state, or in that, for that matter, nation. So what is that new and reinvigorated argument? And does the storm, the recent devastation from the hurricane, play into this? Governor Navarez, good to have you on the show, sir. Thank you very much, David. Thank you for having me and uh, having the opportunity to talk to you. So let's take a look at my... uh, view of this or not necessarily view but my first question let's take the first question yes did the hurricane and the after effects and the recognition of so much failure in 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 internal governance and economics play into this reinvigorated push for statehood well uh the truth of the matter is that uh, it did raise the awareness of the situation of Puerto Rico. It did raise uh, an awareness here stateside as to the uh, uh, situation, the colonial situation that exists in Puerto Rico. But uh, this situation and and this claim uh, for equal uh, treatment, equal participation is not new. As a matter of fact, uh, a brief story of uh, Puerto Rico going back to its discovery in 1493 from with uh, Christopher Columbus and then in 1898, uh, becoming a part of the United States as Spain ceded uh, the territory of Puerto Rico to the U.S., uh, subsequently, uh, the, the definition of what that uh, particular political status uh, means in insular cases, which are uh, federal court cases that establish what uh, powers Congress has over its territories, in, in particular over Puerto Rico, The history goes to 1917, where uh, Puerto Rican people were granted American citizenship, and uh, goes into 1952, when the current uh, arrangement, uh, which is a territorial arrangement, but under the name of Commonwealth, uh, which uh, Congress delegated uh, some of its powers for Puerto Rico to adopt its own constitution. So it's a long-standing story. It's a it's a story that uh, has 120 years uh, under the U.S. sovereignty. It has over 100 years as uh, natural-born U.S. citizens in a territory that uh, obviously does not partake of its full rights as American citizens. And the, there there is a recent push. You, you're correct in that. And it has to do with uh, some events that have happened uh, in the past few years. The courts, the federal courts, in a case called uh, Puerto Rico versus Sanchez Valle in 2016, uh, unequivocally stated that Puerto Rico does not have a separate sovereignty. It is all under the plenary powers of Congress. Congress, uh, utilizing that authority, uh, legislated a law called PROMESA, in Spanish uh, it means promise, also in 2016, essentially taking over 
the powers uh, that uh, the Puerto Rico elected uh, government has and limiting its uh, possibilities. Uh, this has been, again, uh, brought to the forefront by executive uh, presidential task forces, uh, the, the last one uh, under Obama, but previously under President Bush also. And more important than this is that uh, the people of Puerto Rico has spoken. In a plebiscite in 2012, uh, it rejected the territorial option and of the alternatives uh, presented to the people of Puerto Rico, 61% chose statehood. More recently, this past year, 2017, again, another plebiscite took place. And at that point, 97% of the people voted for statehood. Now, so let's look at this? that vote for a moment, because in that referendum in 2017, only 23 percent of Puerto Ricans voted. Ninety seven percent of that 23 percent voted for statehood. So yes. to just to keep those numbers in full context, 23 percent of the people went to the polls. I want to go to the yes. economics of this. Puerto Rico. Wait, wait, let, let me let me make a, uh, a point here. Uh, are you suggesting that because 23 percent of the registered voter uh, went to the polls that uh, this is not valid? No, I'm saying that I just want the people to understand full context that only a certain percentage of Puerto Rico's voted, Puerto Ricans voted, and frankly, the other percent should have showed up to vote, and then we would put those numbers in there. On the, right, eco but, on the economics me, of me, this, go, go yeah, ahead, let, Governor. Let me, let me uh, make a final point. If you look at uh, multiple examples, and I will just give you one, in Texas, a constitutional amendment in 2015 adopted with only 11% of the registered voters. Subsequently, in 2017, Texas again, another constitutional amendment adopted with only 5%. And so, by the way, I would apply the same reason, which is I would lay out who many, how many percent, how many as a percentage of the population voted. That's not, a, I'm, by the way, this is not a, an attack on the, call it the 97% number. I'm putting everything in context. And by the way, Governor, I'm a fan of more participation. I find it just, just as an adjunct. I find it frankly disgusting that the American populace, or even in this case, the Puerto Rican territorial population does not come out and vote when there's an important issue. We see that in congressional elections. But that aside, let's go to how Puerto Rico has been governed over the years. And whether it's Republican or Democrat, and there are lots of reasons that we don't have the time to get into, but where Puerto Rico is now and over the years, it has developed uh, 78 municipos governed by mayors for a small population, it has significant and has had significant corruption in the past. And as, as someone who's from the Caribbean and sees this in other Caribbean islands, it's almost a, uh, it's just a Caribbean mentality, I think, with a lot of these governing bodies. And the economics and the way they've dealt with their infrastructure, the single utility provider, you're right about the PROMESA agreement, but that agreement didn't reverse all of the bad practices and all the things needed to make that island more stable for the people that it's that live there so with all that in there what is statehood supposed to do and who absorbs the cost of making puerto rico a state and bringing it shall we say up to par well let me let me say that uh you're you're absolutely right in how we've reached the untenable situation that we are now confronting. You are absolutely right. The, the problem is that uh, a significant part of that is that Puerto Rico cannot uh, function with the same rules that apply to the different states. And uh, it is uh, not only in this case, but in many other cases where you, where you see a, colon, a colonial type of relationship, the colony can never uh, come up to the level of the metropolitan power. That's that's a uh, historical truth across the ages. So, but you're right. So, for example, uh, you mentioned the uh, monopoly or the almost monopoly in uh, energy or power uh, generation in Puerto Rico. And that's true, and that has to change. Uh, 
the same situation occurred before. A communications uh, monopoly was in place in Puerto Rico uh, during my administration, and that was uh, disbanded, sold, uh, and it's now a totally private type of uh, endeavor uh, for communications in Puerto Rico, telecommunications. So I, I think you're right in pointing out things that we have to do to improve uh, that uh, structure. But you have to admit that uh, Puerto Rico is at an unfair advantage, uh, at a disadvantage, uh, because of the fact that we do not have the full rights that uh, other citizens in the different states have. So I, I, I posit to you that the solution to the uh, situation, uh, if you want to just look at it from the economic or financial uh, uh, perspective, is to allow Puerto Rico to compete on an equal basis. History is on the side that when a territory becomes a state, its economy uh, takes off. Uh, the last two examples of this uh, were uh, Alaska and uh, Hawaii. And so what I'm, what I'm uh, asking you to understand is that uh, we need to take some corrective steps no question about it right and to that point especially including hawaii and alaska one of the reasons their economies took off because within the insular economy of each of those states they maximized the use of their resources and their economic resources even to the point of being a in the case of hawaii a naval facility as well as the other things they exported puerto rico is a rich island when it comes to natural resources but those resources have been abused and not properly used in the governance of that island, whether in the private sector or the public sector. And if they did that, then it would likely be more reflective of what happened in Guam, also a territory, smaller territory, even less, if you want to call it some natural resources, pivotal in communication uh, with Asia. But again, using what is to your advantage is something Puerto Rico has failed to do. Well, uh, Puerto Rico has some advantages that it can uh, provide uh, to the nation. Uh, first of all, it is a crossroads of uh, the two major cultures uh, in the hemisphere, the Anglo-English uh, tradition culture and the Hispanic or Spanish uh, tradition. They both uh, coexist in Puerto Rico. Geographically, it is a central point in the intercommunication of the Americas. Uh, we do have uh, certain uh, resources, not uh, oil, uh, but we have in this era of... Uh, Governor, I've got to pause you there. Uh, can you hold on? I want to finish the conversation on the other side of this. Sure. All right, we'll take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll pick up and finish properly. I don't like to cut people short. Governor, uh, Former governor of Puerto Rico, Pedro Rosello Navarez, on their statehood commission. You want answers. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth, David. When truth is the authority. Oh, it's true. It's true. I will tell the truth. Truth is the authority. It's true. It's true. We deserve the truth. This is the David Webb Show. David Webb. Six nine five Patriot nine five seven two eight seven four. Continuing my conversation with the former governor of Puerto Rico, Pedro Rosello Navarez, a Democrat member of the Puerto Rico Statehood Commission. Uh, governor, I didn't want to cheat you out of your comment and not finish properly, so let's uh, get back to it. Thanks for joining me. Thank you, David. So uh, <clears throat> go ahead and finish your last thought, and then I have a question well, next. Well, basically, you were talking about uh, what uh, contributions uh, Puerto Rico uh, could basically uh, make for the nation. And I first point out to the uh, military co contribution. Uh, Puerto Rico has been a participant higher than uh, almost all of the states per capita in all the uh, military conflicts uh, that the United States has been involved in since the First World War. Secondly, economic. Uh, this is uh, oversimplification, but uh, currently uh, we have a commerce with the rest of the states that's over $70 billion a year. So it's a significant 
uh, factor. Fiscally, uh, we it, it's uh, it's said that Puerto Ricans don't pay uh, federal taxes. Well, we do. Not all. But we pay, for example, Medicare taxes. We pay income taxes on uh, income derived from stateside uh, sources. Uh, but interestingly enough, if Puerto Rico becomes a state, as a state in equal, um, uh, equal level with the rest of the states, it assumes the U.S. debt, which is three times greater per capita, than our own state debt. So that Puerto Rico would be assuming uh, part of that uh, U.S. Uh, debt. And finally, I must say the most important thing for me is that uh, uh, this has to do with uh, democratic values of the nation. Our forefathers created a republic. Uh, during the period uh, transition from the 19th to the 20th century, uh, this uh, morphed into an empire losing its uh, basic democratic values of a republic. And uh, until and unless uh, the U.S. Uh, finalizes its uh, territorial uh, possessions, it will not be able to count itself as one of a democratic uh, republic. So, All right, so those are fair points on what you can offer and what you can use. And, you know, I apply this to any state. If you're an energy-rich state, you use your resource. If you are a sure. land-rich state, you use your resource. If you grow flowers, you use your resource. Food, the breadbasket, California, Puerto Rico, your fair points are there because the Caribbean is an area where the islands have very good natural resources. However, I have to ask, and because this statement, I feel, doesn't help uh, the case, and this is uh, from your former governor, also your fellow Democrat, uh, former Governor Romero, and he made this statement uh, regarding the, the state's, uh, the commission's effort. He says, I, and I'm quoting him, I'm sick and tired of not having the right to vote, and the nation cannot stand anywhere in the world and have the moral authority to talk about civil rights and voting rights without the resolving the issue of Puerto Rico. He then goes on to say, uh, you know what we ha why we haven't achieved because of prejudice prejudice against Hispanics. If we were instead an island of three and a half million, if we were instead of an island of three and a half million Hispanics, we were an island of three and a half million Irishmen. We probably would have been a state a while ago. And I would challenge the governor that that is absolutely false, that you could put this on prejudice rather than a discussion on, shall we say, statehood and legal and constitutional structure. I, I agree with you, and, and I'm not going to speak for the former governor Romero. Uh, he has his own view. Uh, my view particularly is that this has to do with certain fundamental principles. And the principles is that in a republic, every citizen should have equal rights. Puerto Rico has 3.5 million U.S. citizens. Those U.S. citizens do not have equal rights. And as a matter of fact, I uh, challenge you by saying that no matter where you're born, if you are a U.S. citizen, uh, you were born in uh, California or Florida or uh, Montana, if you decide to go to Puerto Rico, and reside there, put your residence in Puerto Rico, you lose those rights that you have to vote for the president, to have a, a congressional delegation with a voice and, and vote. So that essentially we're looking here at a uh, artificial geographic ghetto where by the mere, uh, let's say, uh, accident of living there, you lose certain fundamental rights that are afforded to all citizens throughout the nation so, so governor I, can we talk about what puerto rico could do and i i would pa i'll use your word i'll posit this in order to make your case stronger one of the things and we've talked about the economics of puerto rico and, and where it is now and the economics plays into what you can afford to do we saw that play out in the recent tragedy with the hurricanes and still playing out as the island continues to struggle to recover uh, for instance, there was a consolidation effort underway some years ago to bring instead of 78 municipals representing three and a half million people and under examination, many of them somewhat uh, 
I hate to use the term, but banana republic like in the way the local government was dealing with things, helping their friends. Uh, this is a reality that played out down there. Would Puerto Rico begin to consolidate its political governance structure and clean up its government in order to make the case of wanting to be a state and as responsible and requiring balanced budgets, proper economic management, proper governmental management? Well, uh, let me tell you, uh, you can always point to uh, deficiencies, and, and I accept uh, what you're pointing out. My point is if you uh, fix uh, those deficiencies to make your case stronger well, as you my, go my to Washington. Would, my, my point would be that until we have the full powers that are afforded American citizens, we will be unable to really uh, deal with all those uh, problems in a uh, in a very positive way. You called uh, that a, a banana republic. I would say that maybe you could use the term as a banana territory, uh, because basically that's what it is. It's an it's a area of powerlessness. It's but, but Governor, with all due respect, and I hear your points on this, with all due respect, Puerto Rico now, as a governmental body, can make the decision for instance, to consolidate and clean up its own governmental structure. That doesn't require statehood to do that. It is. That's right. It is going through specifically that process right now as we speak. The state legislature has approved uh, the governor's uh, plan for restructuring what will be a uh, reduction of about 134 agencies right now into 40 agencies so that the process is going through right now and, and we agree that we have to go through that structural process but i i uh, want to emphasize that uh you cannot compete uh really unless you have an, an equal uh scenario equal rights equal instruments and therefore that's when you will see a very major step taken into correcting all these uh, problems. Governor, a fair debate. I appreciate you joining me. I hope we can uh, pick up on this as it moves forward and maybe have other members of your commission on. Why don't we have next time a Republican and Democrat member of the commission? Absolutely. Absolutely. We will do that. I uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, converse with you on these uh, issues. And certainly we can we can do that in the future. Thank you, uh, Governor. Great to have you on the show. 866-95-PATRIOT, 957-2874, on Twitter, at David Webb Show.